Yeah. Let's go. What's going on, everybody? It's your boy Dead on Dave. How y'all doing today? Welcome back to the channel. Let's cut the music. Uh, check it out, guys. I had a really good show last night, Dead on Dave Live. Appreciate everybody who called in. That's fantastic. Before we get started today, I'm not going to waste a lot of time on this. Uh, Joe Cronin continues to do videos. That's completely fine. But here's the thing: I'm not. I don't really give a crap about this whole situation much anymore. But I'm not going to be lied upon. So I'm just going to simply clear up a quick fallacy that he stated in his video last night. He stated I didn't, I stated many times that I did not invite him on the show last night, which is bullshit. As you can see right here, here's the screenshot. I invited him on. I said, I'm still going on Sunday, every Sunday from one to three. You're more than welcome to join me in BS. I even say I love doing videos with you because it's, we've always done great work. I also say right there, it's all good. I hope that we can work together uh, in, in, in time. But, you know, it is what it is, and you can't convince people of what they don't want to hear. So, I don't know my damn thing <laughs> uh, So, you know, it is what it is, but that's all I'm going to talk I'm not talking about any, it anymore today. If I don't have to, believe me, I'm not going to because he he's going on and on and trying to become you know, the victim in a situation that he created. I didn't leave him. I never wanted to leave. I didn't mine him for subs. That's insulting to me, and it's insulting to everything that I've done on this channel. But it is what it is. It's no big deal. And unfortunately, it doesn't even look like we're going to salvage a friendship out of this because he just refuses to stop. But it's all good, folks. Let's get back. To, let's get down to what you're here for. And that is, of course, because it is Monday and it's your daily focus. And it is Monday night raw preview time. So let's jump right into it. Jeez. All right. So what to look for from Monday night raw. We know that Monday was... Last Monday was awesome. Coming off of WrestleMania, WrestleMania was incredible. Monday Night Raw hit a different level, something that we haven't seen from Raw in so long. It felt big. It felt like a pay-per-view. It felt like a good pay-per-view because let's face it, a lot of pay-per-views aren't very good in the first damn place. But this felt like a good pay-per-view. It felt entertaining and fun and fresh, and there was new faces and old faces and storylines. It was just great. So I think the first question that you need to ask is, can Raw continue to be as exciting as it was last week? Will it want to? Will WWE, WWE even want to continue to make a compelling product? Which is seems like a weird question, but I mean, they proved that they can do it whenever they like. So why wouldn't they want to do it? So if tonight's Raw comes out flat, the question has to be, why? <laughs> so that's the first question. What is your faith that Monday Night Raw will continue to capitalize on what we saw last week? Because last week was such a good week in wrestling. Put in the comment section below if you feel that Monday Night Raw will continue to be something worth watching. Or was it just an apparition? What do you think? The tag team division, let's move on to the tag team division. I think there's a good question going on with the tag team division right now. There's some tag teams that are that are coming up, that are tag teams that are changing. There are tag teams that are being used that hadn't been used in a while. So let's talk about that one first. The Ascension finally got back into a storyline, which we haven't seen them in a few weeks. It feels like months, actually. But it seems like the Ascension might be getting used back into the tag team turmoil situation that's going on right now also the lucha dragons the 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 team that took down the ascension yeah oh uh, no wait the lucha dragon yeah yeah the lucha dragons took the nxt titles off the ascension uh they are they going to continue to impress are they going to be the next big tag team within wwe are they true contenders to kid and cesaro 
And will Kalisto continue to carry the Lucha Dragons and wow the WWE Universe? Because let's face it, the Lucha Dragons are interesting because of Kalisto, not because of Sin Cara. Sin Cara's been here before. We know what we're going to get out of Sin Cara, and honestly, people don't care. But Kalisto had people on their feet. Kalisto had people's jaws on the, on the, on the floor. Now, Kalisto has had botch problems down in NXT. Will he have those problems in WWE? And when he does, inevitably, because that type of high-risk style that they do, you know, it just it goes with the territory, how will the reaction be? Will the fans kind of turn on him? Or have they found, have WWE found what they want so badly, and that's a replacement for Rey Mysterio? Kalista looks like him. He moves well like him. Well, old Rey. Uh, Kalisto's got a lot going on, and I feel he's got a much more diverse move set than the WWE version of Rey Mysterio. You got to remember, Rey Mysterio, as great as he was, he was quite limited because of his knees. He already had like two or three knee surgeries by the time he came to WWE. Uh, so he wasn't the same guy that he was in his earlier days. And that's not taking anything away from what Rey accomplished in WWE because, good Lord, he had a great career. He's a Hall of Famer. I don't think there's a question about that. But Kalisto has a much more diverse move set. Uh, I think he's going to wow the fans. And he's going to do everything that the WWE wants him to do, and it should be quite interesting to see the evolution of this guy. And you know, the Lucha Dragons seem to be very much over with the WWE universe right now. Now the question is, can they capitalize on that? But also, how are they going to incorporate some of the other tag teams? into this fight. I mean, it seems like the Usos might be taking a back seat, and that might be because of the injury to Jey Uso, I believe, hurt his shoulder. Uh, now, does that give an opening to a team like the New Day, who seem seemingly be are going through a transition? It seems like they are going to get, gonna be turning into a much more edgy team. Maybe not even edgy, but definitely a heel. I think that the face stuff is going to be dropping or at least going down. And if that's the case, that's exciting because I think them as a heel group and maybe even expanding possibly with the additions of guys like um, the primetime players who are now back and being very funny, they were hilarious on SmackDown. I think it's very possible they can get involved and after a feud, maybe even merging. But what about having a guy like R-Truth be the leader of this group who, let's face it, even if O'Neal and Darren Young join the group, there's not a big veteran presence besides Kofi Kingston. And Kofi's not a leader. He hasn't been a leader of the New Day now. And it's Actually, it's kind of hard to, to say who the real leader is of the New Day. I mean, you thought at first it would be Xavier Woods, but it's really not. It's more Big E than anybody. So I think for someone like Our Truth to come in and take charge, that's one way that they can turn this to make it even more interesting. But having the New Day get more edgy and kind of buy into the New Day sucks chant, I think will help their image and help the rivalry going forward with not only the primetime players, but also getting them into the action in the tag team division uh, in general. So we'll see what happens there. Excitement, though. There's possibilities in the tag team division that we haven't seen in a very long time, so that's pretty cool. Speaking of something that we haven't seen in a very long time, there's newfound rejuvenation within the Divas division, and that comes off the heels. Of course, It's a devastating blow to lose AJ Lee. There's no question about that. But the reality is with AJ leaving, it creates an opening. And that opening, some would argue, has already been filled by page anyway but it's still even with, with her just absolutely for sure not being there anymore someone's got to step up whether it be from nxt or somebody that's on the roster that person seemingly seemingly is naomi i don't know if naomi is going to be able to consistently perform well enough to be taken seriously she looked very good against natalia it looks like she's going to continue to get a push and go in against the Bellas. I, I also believe she's returning to Total Divas, which I guess should not be a surprise that she's getting more of a, a push now that she's going back to Divas. I think she's going back to Total Divas. That, that was a press release that I read, but I don't know. Uh, 
But the question is, will the Bellas turn their attention to Naomi now fully? And if they do, what type of matches will we see? Will Naomi have to go through Brie to get to Nikki? And what type of matches are we going to see between them when that inevitably happens? Does Paige sit back and do nothing? How does she get more involved? What about Natalia, who took a loss to Naomi, but has been kind of completely re-establishing herself as not only a physical pre presence, but an interesting uh, character presence as well? So the Divas division has intrigue, and that's not even taken into consideration that the obvious move to replace AJ would be to bring someone up, maybe Sasha Banks even in the, ahead of Charlotte, uh, up to the main roster. So there is so much intrigue and there's a lot of brightness for the both the Divas division and the tag team division. That's something that we haven't been able to say for a long time. So WWE, WrestleMania has really served as a reset button in a lot of ways, which is it kind of supposed to do, but it's a bright reset button. And there's some really cool things happening right now with some of the divisions that have been forgotten. We'll see what happens and will the Diva division really start to shine? We'll find out tonight. I think that will go a long way in showing it. They should be setting up something for Extreme Rules. I mean, we're a few weeks away now, so you'd figure they got to set this up tonight. It's got to start, right? We'll see. Next up is uh, really it comes to Cena and Rusev. Now, I, I, I wish I was more excited about it, but I got to be honest. I went back and I watched a WrestleMania match yet again. And I gotta be honest, it just wasn't that great. The build-up before, both of their entr entrances were amazing and had this bigger feel. But the match itself, if you're judging the match based off of just the merit of the match, I think you're going to be really disappointed. Yes, there is the cool stunner off the, the second rope, the bouncing stunner by Cena. Which, looking at it a couple more times, I'm not even sure it was on purpose. <laughs> uh... There was a couple other good spots, but Rusev and Cena's style don't mesh together because they're so similar. They're so similar. They're both plotting big men. They're just they're bigger guys that plot around the ring and then have short bursts of energy to create their offense. That's what both they have no substance. They have no technical backgrounds to really fall back on. So their rest holds look just like that. Rest holds. And that, and that sucks. That takes away from the psychology of matches. It takes away from the, the dynamic feel of matches. And it waters them down, to be completely honest. So the question is, regardless of what they're going to do with this feud going forward, which, you know, let's face it, is going to continue to revolve around America and Russia, why should we care about the, the actual matches? Because at the end of the day, this is still wrestling. Yes, it's sports entertainment. But it's the product in the ring that's going to continue to drive people to give a crap. And I don't know if Cena and Rusev having a third bout at Extreme Rules is exactly what we need. It's not working. There's got to be a change to this feud, whether it be Lana turning on Rusev or something. But I think there has to be a change at some point. It's the only way that this rivalry is going to matter, uh, regardless of who they decide to go with at the end of it. If, if Cena is going to retain or if Rusev will regain his title, uh, however they decide to go with it, it's got to be done properly. So when that payoff does happen, it matters. So what can they do? At this point, I don't know, unless... They can put Cena in a time machine and they can make Rusev, and, you know, I don't know, work a better style with Cena, which I don't think is possible because of just their limitations. I'm just not sure what they can do to really make this rivalry matter. Yeah, at least more than just the America Russia angle, which is what's carrying this, by the way. And I don't know. Cena, it should be more than that, you would think. Uh,. This leads me to another guy that I'm really excited about. I talked about Kalisto a little bit earlier. But he wasn't the only guy who made his debut on Raw. Uh, the man that gravity forgot, Neville. I like his full name, Adrian Neville. But Neville, what is he going to do for an encore to his amazing debut 
last week on Monday Night Raw. I mean, I don't think there's any question he should lose that friggin' cape. It's atrocious. It looks like something a dungeon master would wear. What is he, Neville the Dungeon Master? Plus three of red arrow high flying. I'm wearing my cape of death defying. I don't understand what the hell the point is. It, it drives me absolutely crazy. There's no point for the cape. Neville is good enough to do this on his own. He doesn't, his speaking ability, which is not very good, uh, be damned. It's not even his ability. His, his things that he says aren't bad. You just can't understand a friggin' word that he says, but that's not his fault. It's, it's where he was born in England. It's just, that's not his fault. So, <laughs> but it's, it's crazy because this guy is that good and he can mesmerize and he will continue to do so. Uh, so who do they put him in the ring with this week? Do they do another Curtis Axel uh, match or do they let him, you know, interrupt somebody else who's being a douche nozzle and let him have a match with them? It'll be interesting to see, but I think Neville has to be on the show because of how damn exciting that he is. But WWE likes to do this thing where moves that are over, and the Red Arrow is certainly a stunner. They don't always want to show it all the time. And maybe that'll be the case because they believe in this stupid, stupid, stupid notion of special attractions that they should only be seen every so often. That's bullshit. It's retarded. It makes no sense. It, it absolutely makes no sense. Did seeing a stunner ever get old? Fuck no. Did seeing a rock bottom ever get old? Fuck no. Did seeing a people's elbow get old? No, and that was the lamest move of all time. Did seeing sweet chin music ever get old? No, they're finishers. We're supposed to see them every match, and they're supposed to be important. Not only is it his finisher, it's his signature move. That is what Adrian Neville is known for, and it's what we want to see. So please, WWE, do not be stupid. Do not think that you have to keep this guy off of uh, television to protect him, because that's just retarded. Let's get more Neville, and hopefully we will see another match out of him that will be just as exciting as his debut was last week. I think we move on to Sheamus now. Uh, what is he going to do on Monday? What is Sheamus' endgame? He's going to continue to get these uh, You Look Stupid chants because he looks like a, a weird steampunk pirate. Uh... <laughs> That just, I don't know. I don't know what, the, a punk pirate, a pirate punk. I have no idea what you want to call Seamus' look. I kind of like it, this post-apocalyptic, you know, Celtic warrior vibe. I kind of like it. I, I like his look. I like that there's a change. But I wish he would ditch the fella and the other mannerisms that have always been known with Seamus. There's no point in it anymore. But what is his endgame? Is he going to be the first to challenge Daniel Bryan for the Intercontinental title? Or will he just continue to target underdogs? I mean, is he going to target Daniel Bryan again? Will he go after Ziggler? And how does Bad News Barrett, and Ziggler for that matter, fit into this situation? Are they going to have a fatal four-way at Extreme Rules? What type of match can we expect to see? Uh, with Daniel... With Daniel Bryan bleeding on SmackDown and seemingly blading, for my money, it looked like he bladed because the way he revealed it, he revealed the blood so dramatically. And are they going to do maybe set up a first blood match for Extreme Rules? I know they haven't done that in a long time, but this would be something that they could save for a pay-per-view. And it'd be quite interesting to see if that's the route they go. It would not shock me at all, to be completely honest at this point. Who else can they put into this match, or do they need to put into this angle to, to make Sheamus look even more legit? Should Sheamus start going after Barrett? But that wouldn't really make sense, because Barrett's a real man. He's a big guy, you know? So, I don't know. It, it's going to be quite interesting. you got to figure he's going to continue to go after Ziggler and Brian. And more than likely, what we're going to get on Raw is the tag team match we didn't get on SmackDown. Daniel Bryan and Dolph Ziggler versus Bad News Barrett and the new uh, post-apocalyptic Irish Celtic warrior Seamus. I paused there for a second. I completely lost my, my focus. Uh, but I'd like to see more matches with him. And I'm glad that he is wrestling and he's not just back and saying stupid stuff. Y if you're going to be an ass kicker, you got to kick ass. So at least have him kick some ass. And he's done that since coming back. So I think we'll continue to see that. 
I think one of the more intriguing things for Monday Night Raw people tuning in is the Lesnar fallout. What are we going to learn, if anything, about his suspension and subsequent fine? Uh, how big will the fine be? Will it really make... I, I, I've got a feeling it's going to be a million dollars. I really do. Because they're going to try and go with an astronomical amount. Will Cole, who will be there along with Booker T and JBL, even though they were crushed by an announce table, uh, will Cole do or say anything about last week? There's been speculation that Cole could be taking legal action. I hope they don't. I hope they don't do a, uh, a I'm going to sue you bit. I think that's stupid. Uh, will Heyman be on TV tonight? Or will Heyman, along with Lesnar, be off of television to kind of make it more special when Lesnar returns. Uh, if Heyman does show up on TV, what's going to happen to him? Is he going to be held responsible for the actions of Brock Lesnar? If Heyman's going to be there, will he start representing somebody else while Lesnar is suspended? What's the best way to do this? Uh, right now, the figurehead of this angle has been Stephanie McMahon. Will that continue to be the case? Can Heyman possibly bring somebody else up to be a thorn in WWE side? I don't know. Maybe someone like Rhino, who's now back within the fold. That wouldn't be a terrible thing. You want to get the crowd going? Have Heyman bring in Rhino. What about Rob Van Dam? Someone else we haven't seen in a very long time. These are guys that they could put in with Heyman to either you know further his storyline as far as Almost like an invasion or a, you know, revenge thing or Heyman trying to be a pain in the ass. Or they can use them to torment Paul Heyman. I don't know. There's a whole bunch of different things that they can do. Uh, they have so many open-ended options with Paul Heyman right now. And I think it's it's interesting and it's fun and it's fresh. I think this is very fresh. It's a fresh storyline. People want to see what's going to happen with Brock Lesnar because... Because of one term and one match, Suplex City, bitch, and that amazing main event at WrestleMania, Brock Lesnar has become the hottest property in the WWE, plain and simple. So what are they going to do to capitalize on that? And is keeping him off television for a long period of time a really good idea? These are all questions that we're going to get a little bit more clarity to tonight on Monday Night Raw. Finally... We're going to talk about the WWE World Heavyweight title situation. What is next for Seth Rollins, the new champion who is kind of acting Weasley in this way that I really like that we don't get. We haven't had a Weasley champion like this probably since uh, The Miz, to be honest. I mean, I can't think of another guy that's coming to my head who's kind of just being slimy and ducking people a little bit. Now, granted, Rollins only been champion a week, so it's hard to say that definitively that's who he's being. But... The way he's kind of getting around Orton, the way he kind of ducked Lesnar, it's interesting. And Rollins can play that role, but he can also play the badass because, man, can he back it up. I'm not thrilled with this Orton and Rollins rivalry because I felt that it was basically put to bed at WrestleMania. I don't see how they could possibly top that finish. Uh, there's not going to be a match that's going to have a finish better than that RKO. I don't see Orton getting the belt at this point in his career again, especially beating Rollins because it would take away all the momentum that Rollins got from just basically one moment. Uh, but to be to be fair to that, Rollins has been in or around the main title picture for quite a long time since he won Money in the Bank. So I, I think that it's going to be important to keep an eye on this because Orton, yes, he's going to get his title shot at Extreme Rules, but what about a man like Roman Reigns? Is he going to get back in the game? And if he does, how are they going to insert him back in the game? Is he just going to start winning matches? Is he going to start beating people up? Or is he going to continue to do these stupid promos that nobody wants to hear? You're not getting Reigns over with interviews. You're not going to get him over with promos. If you want to get Roman Reigns over, he's got to kick ass. That's it. Be the badass Samoan that Paul Heyman trumped him up to be. Okay? It's that simple. And to do that, get him involved in this storyline. He needs to be a guy with no moral friggin' sway one way or the other. He has to be a guy that would not hesitate to knock out Rollins and Orton 
insert himself into this situation and possibly even make this a triple threat at Extreme Rules. Now, I see that as very unlikely considering, you know, Royal Rumble had a triple threat. WrestleMania turned into a triple threat. So I really don't see this being a triple threat uh, for the title at Extreme Rules. But I think you at least have to keep Roman Reigns somewhere in the main title picture. And if not, who can you have him with to make things a little bit more interesting and keep him relevant? Uh, maybe team, I mean, there is a possibility of Big Show and Kane, because they're still in the authority and everything, taking on a tandem of maybe Roman Reigns and Dean Ambrose. Dean Ambrose, who took a big old shit in Kane's uh, office. I mean, <laughs> I think that's a possibility. And it would be good to keep Dean Ambrose around that situation just because when he does eventually get his hands on Seth Rollins again, which I think most people feel that that rivalry will continue once again, it'll make a little bit more sense. Keep them around the main event picture because really there's nowhere else to go with them. Reigns has nowhere else to go right now. Uh, and neither does uh, Dean Ambrose. I mean, unless you're going to insert them into one of the other mid-card title pictures, which are kind of full at the moment. And then there's the enigma that is Ryback. What are they going to do with Ryback? Ryback's got to get involved here. He is beyond mid-card, but he's not main event. He's this mid-main event guy right now that is over with the fans. you got to do something with him. So there's a bunch of guys that are backlogged towards the top of the roster that uh, they have nothing to do with. So they got to figure out how they can incorporate these guys and make this an interesting situation. Now, the problem does become the lack of heels, but that can be addressed too because possibly Bray Wyatt can reemerge tonight. How is he going to respond after the loss to The Undertaker? Are they even going to address that? Is Bray Wyatt going to stay off TV for a little bit to resell his coming back with even more of a vengeance, which he's done like two or three times. Bray Wyatt and Ryback make sense. Bray Wyatt and Roman Reigns make sense. Bray Wyatt and Dean Ambrose does not make sense. Oh my God, it didn't work the first time, won't work again. So the question is, how can they book these guys to make it relevant? There's not enough heels in the company right now, top level heels to, to make the math work. So what do you do? Who knows at this point? Well, that's about all I got. <laughs> <laughs> I talked my face off. I got nothing else. So look, I hope you guys uh, uh, enjoyed the show. Hope you guys watch Rod Night and enjoy that as well. Make sure you stay tuned a little bit later on. Myself and the great Jeff Huffman will be doing our second episode of Touch 'Em All, our new weekly baseball show, and we're going to get into everything that happened last night and opening day for Major League Baseball, opening evening as it would be, and some big moves that happened in the world of baseball. So make sure you guys are checking that out. That'll be a lot of fun. And we will see you next time right here on Dead on Dave Productions. Peace!